This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Imagine you're looking at a scale. Put everything you do for other people on one side and everything you do for yourself on the other. Not balanced? Maybe it's time to spend a little more time on you. Do that in therapy at betterhelp.com slash super. Hey, brother. Okay, you guys, let's talk a little bit about Tom Riddle, AKA the Dark Lord, AKA Lord Voldemort. The character and the person are pretty much just evil all the way through and pretty much have been since the beginning. And at times I felt like this made him slightly less compelling because when you have a character who's just evil for the sake of being evil, it's like less relatable. Voldemort, I guess at this age, Tom Riddle's upbringing wasn't very typical, but we know even from a very young age without any example set for him, he was already using things like pain, fear, manipulation, and bullying to get his way. And while I never got the idea that Wool's Orphanage was like the happiest place, I also don't think it was the driving force for why he turned out the way he did. But it did get me wondering, is it possible Voldemort was just like a loving childhood away from being the next most talented wizard, the next dumb Dumbledore instead of the next Grindelwald? Like, say for example, what if Voldemort had been raised by Molly Weasley or someone like that? Like, would he have still turned out evil? I'm genuinely asking, like, what is the nature versus nurture balance that needs to be met here? Or is there any balance that could have ever been struck at all? Or is it all down to nature when it comes to Voldemort? Could he have been nicer or was he destined to be evil because he was simply born that way? Well, from love potions to blood purity, today we find out. Okay, so before we begin, just from the onset, I just want to say that I, in real life here, don't actually think anyone is just born evil. And like I said before, I think the fact that Voldemort is just pure evil is kind of what makes him a little less compelling overall. Like, I don't immediately understand the seemingly innate drive of Voldemort to seize power and spread darkness. Nor do I think I even have a clear idea what the wizarding world would look like in general with Voldemort as... King? Either way, this book isn't real life. There's things like magic in play, plus some other unique circumstances we definitely need to consider that make it very possible that Voldemort is simply the living, breathing embodiment of evil itself. Which, if true, means there is literally nothing anyone ever could have done to have changed it. He was just destined to be that way. In fact, I think it's quite possible the entire premise of the Fantastic Beast movie franchise was to help better illustrate just how dangerous Voldemort really was and why he was the way he was, but more on that in a bit. For Voldemort, it all comes down to two major points about the events leading up to his conception and birth. First is the complete and utter lack of love involved in his creation as a child. And this is important because in the wizarding world, love is the most powerful kind of magic. It's Harry's secret weapon against Voldemort. Dumbledore explains with some general resentment from Harry that the power he possesses that makes him so very capable of destroying Voldemort is his ability to love. Which to Harry is almost laughable. It comes so naturally to him that he doesn't even consider the possibility that it could be powerful. I know, said Harry impatiently, I can love. It was only with difficulty that he stopped himself adding, big deal. And while this does make Harry uniquely capable of fending off Voldemort, it also seems like it's the source of Voldemort's power as well. His lack of compassion or love at all allows for a willingness to do anything, anything, to seize power. And that could be dark magic or murder or even severing someone's soul into seven pieces. Harry himself even points out this distinction in their final battle. You think you know more magic than I do? Than I, Lord Voldemort, who has performed magic that Dumbledore himself never dreamed of? Oh, he dreamt of it, said Harry, but he knew more than you, knew enough not to do what you've done. And of course, what Dumbledore understood was this. I do not think he understands why, Harry, but then he was such a hurry to mutilate his own soul, he never paused to understand the incomparable power of a soul that is untarnished and whole. The point that Harry and Dumbledore are making here is that someone capable of love, like even at all, would never have even been able to consider making a horcrux, let alone seven. But so why is Voldemort so lacking? Why is he literally incapable of love? Well, it all goes back to his mother. 
Merope. As we all know, Voldemort's mother harbored a forbidden crush on the handsome muggle Tom Riddle, who used to ride by the Gaunt Shack. He, of course, has zero affection towards her or the Gaunts at all, and yet Merope manages to seduce him by means of a love potion, and the two end up married, very much against Tom's will. And while I'm sure it's not hard to see that this is a pretty evil act, the use of a love potion doesn't always scream, you know, dark magic. Like, as formidable as it is, it also doesn't seem like the kind of drink you'd see on the shelves at like Borgen and Burks. However, even Slughorn points out just how dangerous it can be. Hamotentia doesn't really create love, of course. It is impossible to manufacture or imitate love. No, this will simply cause a powerful infatuation or obsession. It is probably the most dangerous and powerful potion in this room. Which is saying something, considering the other potions in the room are Veritaserum, Felix Felicis, and Polyjuice. So anyway, not only is Tom Riddle forced to marry against his will, he is also then forced to conceive a child against his will with Merope. At which point she thinks she is finally safe to lift the enchantment. Like, certainly Tom will stick around, if not for me at least, because he loves his unborn child. <laughs> Right? Wrong. As we know, he immediately abandons them both and has no love for either of them. Which brings us to our first inspection of how Tom Riddle was born already incapable of love. You could look at it pretty simply, like he wasn't the product of true love, but it goes further than that. But hey, on that note, today's show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Ah, being human. When we're at our best, we can do truly amazing things like love. But life is tough, and when it gets you down, it's hard to be the best you that you can. Which is why I'm excited to talk about BetterHelp, because working with a therapist can help you get to the best version of you. I mean, we can't all be born the chosen one, am I right? <laughs> Not that I don't think Harry could have used some therapy. But when you feel empowered and have the tools you need, you're more prepared to handle all the things that life throws at you. And I can speak from the heart on this one, because therapy has helped me so much in my real life, like from setting boundaries to coming up with coping mechanisms. Like, I, I don't know where I would be without it. Genuinely, when I'm Going to therapy consistently, I feel like the best version of myself. Even if I'm not like in the best moment in life at that time, I feel like I have the tools I need to handle that moment. And if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is an amazing option. You can fill out their brief questionnaire to immediately get matched with a therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime you want. For no charge! And let me just tell you, that is an amazing feature, because having the right therapist can make all the difference. And the ability to try different people to find who's right for you at no charge is a Pretty awesome feature. So if you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can help get you there. Go to betterhelp.com slash super to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash super to get 10% off your first month. Link is in the description down below. You might think, well, I guess his father abandoned him and definitely didn't love him, but his mother must have loved him at some point, right? But no, the baby was only ever a tool for her to help sway the adult Tom Riddle. And when that doesn't work, when he leaves, Merope gives up on life, magic, and her son. Her very last wish is for the baby to be named after his father, Tom Riddle. But even that is an act in the name of his mother's own self-interest and not for him. It's as if Merope is trying to prove to herself in her dying moments that yes, this relationship did mean something and will live on, when of course we all know it absolutely did not. And so, in no way, shape, or form does Voldemort enter the world as a product of true, and perhaps more importantly, reciprocated love. And let me just pause right here to say, like, yes, I know things like this absolutely do happen in the real world, and by no means am I trying to suggest that those children are evil at all. Voldemort, however, does have some other fictional forces at play that really, that really do seal his fate, though. And those forces begin with how Merope responds to Tom Riddle abandoning her, something Dumbledore actually explains the massive impact of. It is my belief, I am guessing again, but I am sure I am right, that when her husband abandoned her, Merope stopped using magic. I do not think she wanted to be a witch any longer. Of course, it is also possible that her unrequited love and the attendant despair sapped her of her powers. That can happen. In any case, as you are about to see, Merope refused to raise her wand, even to save her own life. It's so interesting to me how he phrases that. Like, yeah, it's possible her despair sapped her of her powers. That's like what happens to Tonks and Half-Blood Prince. But Dumbledore thinks it is way more likely, and he is positive that he is right, that what actually happened is that Merope decided to stop using her powers altogether. Dare I say, Dumbledore is positive she begins repressing 
her powers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what happens to a witch or wizard that begins doing this that Dumbledore would have a firsthand experience in recognizing? They form an Obscurial. Except, unlike in so many other instances that we've seen so far, this one would be uniquely happening much later on in life, and even more uniquely happening to someone who is actively pregnant. Normally how an Obscurial is described is as a magical parasite that forms inside a witch or wizard who has chosen to stop using their abilities. Or more specifically, is suppressing their abilities. They are extremely powerful, extremely dangerous, and seek only to destroy. Which is a really, really interesting description when you consider everything having to do with the character of Tom Riddle, AKA Voldemort, <laughs> who is himself an extremely dangerous and powerful person who only hopes to cause destruction. But so then what are we saying? That Tom Riddle has an Obscurial? No, what we are saying is that Tom is the Obscurus. It's as if while forming in the womb, he became physically entangled with it, as if it's part of the fabric of his DNA. He is a literal walking human magical cancer, which sounds about right. And this explains Voldemort's innate evilness. It's why even as a child, he begins to manipulate people, use fear. He starts bullying people with no example set for him of any kind. This is just his natural tendency. Which brings me back to the question, what would the wizarding world even look like if Voldemort was successful and was just reigning supreme? Because everything we see during his rise to power feels like a dark cloud of despair. The streets are literally covered in fog caused by Dementors breeding. Like you can't even make the argument that Voldemort was hoping to preserve the wonderful wizarding world he grew up in because he is actively, and in some cases, absolutely intentionally destroying it. Anything off the Trolley dear. Not now, Trolley Witch! Like, why is he destroying everything? Like, what are you hoping to rule over, man? A bunch of ruins? You might be wondering at this point, wait, does this mean that Credence and Fantastic Beasts is evil? Because isn't he kind of the same thing? A human walking around with the contained power of the Obscurus inside him? Who was also raised in an orphanage? An orphanage that was specifically trying to squash the magic out of you? I mean, heck, Wool's Orphanage, where Tom Riddle grew up, is practically sprouting sunshine and rainbows compared to this place. And yet, Credence doesn't actually seem evil. Dangerous, yes, but not actively evil. And that's because he's not. The big difference between Voldemort and Credence is that Credence developed the Obscurial much later in life, and then found a way to contain it. But Credence's ability to do this is so powerful that Galette Grindelwald travels all the way to the United States and spends months trying to get Credence to come to his side. Like Credence is so powerful that another wizard had a vision of his existence as arguably the most powerful magical being on the planet and potentially the only one capable of defeating the other most powerful wizard on the planet, Dumbledore. Grindelwald literally puts two entire movies towards just recruiting Credence to his side. Like, imagine how much easier his entire job would have been if he simply possessed that power innately. If he was just an extremely magically gifted individual with a fascination with the dark arts who had the untamed, unrelenting power of the obs- Oh wait, that's Voldemort. <laughs> Which is why in a lot of ways, I think this might have been the point of the Fantastic Beast movies, to show you why Voldemort is the way that he is. Because what you see in the Fantastic Fantastic Beast movies is this super powerful dark magical entity manipulated by someone who has evil intents. And then you have Voldemort, which is just both of them combined. And this to me explains everything. It is why Voldemort is innately evil. It's why he can't feel remorse. It's why he can't understand love. And it's why no matter what happened to him as a child, he was always going to be evil. And just as an interesting side note, if this is true, then it means that the ultimate evil in Harry Potter is like the personification of repressing your magic, which is to say denying yourself who and what you truly are. So let this just serve as a, your personal reminder to celebrate yourself, whoever you are be super. But guys, thanks so much as always for watching today's video. Don't forget to leave a like on it if you haven't already. If you wanna see what would have happened if Petunia Dursley had been a witch, you can check out this video right here. But otherwise, Ben, until next time, I will see you in another life, brother.